All right, everyone, so thank you for your patience, and uh, please allow me to introduce our next speaker. And so Amanda Marlin, originally from Quebec's Eastern Township, has a degree in geography from Mount Allison uh, University and a master's in environmental studies from Dalhousie University. Amanda has worked in the sustainable community development field for over 20 years, and in the past, she worked as an associate with the Chignecto Consulting Group Incorporated, uh, Mount Allison University's Rural and Small Town Program, and Agriculture Canada. Since 2013, Amanda has been Executive Director at EOS Eco Energy. Her work with EOS has focused on climate change, adaptation, energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, sustainable living, environmental education, and leading a great team of staff and volunteers. She has been on the boards of Astor Group Environmental Services Co-op, New Brunswick's Environmental Network, Beaux-Ajour Renewable Energy Co-op, and is currently a member of the Town of Sackville's Climate Change Advisory Committee of Council. She lives on a small hobby farm in Sackville with her husband, Nick, their two children, dogs, and flock of chickens. Can everybody please give a warm uh, welcome to Amanda. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, thanks for having me. We're really excited to come and share uh, with you a few of our projects at EOS and tell you a little bit about EOS and what we do. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our community-based approaches to climate adaptation. So if you're not familiar with EOS, I'll tell you a little bit about us um, and then get into what climate change adaptation is and the benefits of uh, what you can do in a community-based way. Uh, and then go over some of our projects and in particular I want to focus on our green roofs, our food forests, um, a sea level rise awareness project that we did and um, most um, the newest thing that we're up to is a home flood risk assessment program. So I want to share some new details about that. So EOS um, started back in 2004, so we're almost two decades old. Uh, we're based in Sackville, but we serve the entire Tantramar, Memram Cook region. And soon I guess I'll need to say Tantramar Straight Shores and Memram Cook for out this, uh, this way. Uh, so, um, serving this area with uh, research, with community planning, with education, and with a lot of action projects on the ground as well. Uh, we have a lot of different focus areas, but really everything ties back to climate change in one way or another. So, sustainability, renewable energy projects, waste reduction, climate change adaptation that we're talking about today. Um, and watershed monitoring is something that we've added to our, our sort of work plan in the last few years because we know that climate change is affecting our water quality and quantity and no one had been monitoring our watersheds across this area. So we are helping to fill that gap. So to do all of these things, we collaborate with individuals, with businesses, with all levels of government. Uh, it really takes a lot of partnerships and collaboration to do these sorts of things, especially at the community-based level. I uh, also want to share that we're, we've been a charity for the last year and a half, and so that's been a nice sort of accomplishment, something that we're proud of, uh, that we're a charity now. So what is climate adaptation? Of course, I didn't get to hear all of Jeff's talk. He probably talked about it all already. But, um, we like to talk about the difference between mitigation and adaptation, and so both of these things are needed to address climate change. So mitigation talks about reducing our emissions, um, saving energy, so we're trying to slow climate change down. But no matter how many solar panels we put up in the next little while, we're going to be dealing with climate change for uh, the foreseeable future, and so we need to adapt to those changes as well. So we need to change the ways that we're doing things. Um, and of course, Jeff just mentioned a bunch of things that we can do in terms of how we manage our coasts. Uh, and then the area in the middle, we can certainly do things that um, help us to reduce emissions and adapt at the same time. So things like natural infrastructure, growing food, um, water conservation, public engagement like today helps us achieve both of those. So at EOS, why do we like community-based adaptation, community-based projects? Why are we all about that? Uh, well, we know for sure that climate change is here. It's intensifying. Fiona, Ian, just our most recent examples. There's other issues too, food insecurity, supply chain worries, the pandemic brought a lot of that to life. Um, the fact that we're seeing pandemics and we'll see more of those too as a result of climate change. So 
really it comes down to what can we do at the community level, and we feel a lot of these impacts at the community level together. And so what can we do to help homeowners adapt? What can schools do, other nonprofits? What can we really do locally together? Of course, we need those bigger changes um, from our governments, but what can we do also um, and to improve our communities? So those are the questions we're always asking is what can we do locally? And there's lots of benefits from acting locally too. So it brings our communities together. Um, you get to meet lots of people through the, this kind of work, but we're also building skills and capacity locally in order to build our resilience. Because when it comes down to dealing with the aftermath of Fiona, we're doing it at the community level and we're helping our neighbors clean up and we're helping when people don't have food or don't have power. It's really uh, happens at the community level. So how can we empower our communities and how can we help build that resilience so that we're stronger to deal when the next hurricane or the next um, event happens. So it really is about acting locally together while we perhaps wait for those bigger government um, initiatives and things that we need to uh, so very briefly, because EOS, as I said, has been around for almost two decades, we've done loads of stuff, and it's really hard to narrow it down to give you just some examples of what community-based adaptation looks like. Um, and I want to focus more on what we're doing right now. But in the past, we've also done things like coordinate municipal adaptation plans for Port Elgin, Dorchester, Sackville, and community plans as well. We've planted loads of rain gardens all across our region on private property and public spaces. We have a depaving demo site in downtown Sackville, so that's where we partnered with the town of Sackville, ripped up the asphalt, and put down a permeable pavement so the water, the rainwater can percolate down through. We've organized Tantrum Our Climate Change Week for over a decade now, so every winter that's sort of a, a blitz of events and speakers and activities at schools, all to raise awareness about climate change and what we're doing locally. We've also offered climate stress workshops. So all of this is very anxiety inducing, very stressful, um, hard to deal with, but there are ways that you can cope. And so we've offered those climate stress workshops in partnership with Iris Community Counseling. And so they are the, the counseling experts. I'm certainly not, but partner with people who know how to help us. And those have been really, really nice and helpful. Uh, lots of activities at all of our schools in the region, creating activities and lesson plans, working with students and teachers. Um, and then we've offered loads of workshops over the years, webinars, site tours. We have lots of resources and things on our website as well. Um, and then another really nice community-based um, solution or option is to uh, do bulk purchases. And so we've done a bunch of those over the years. So if we can bring people together to order things at the same time, save everybody a little bit of money. It's interesting that Governments will provide rebates on efficiency upgrades for our homes, but there's no rebates really, or very few, um, on the adaptation front. So if we can help people save a bit of money towards their sump pumps, backwater valves, rain barrels, and emergency kits, that was a really nice bulk purchase that we did many years ago, and perhaps time to do again um, when we see people trying to get ready for hurricanes right now. So those are just some examples of past projects. But let's talk about our current projects too. Uh, so the first is green roofs. So really uh, excited to share a couple of green roof projects that we've been involved with. But first, if you're not familiar with what a green roof is, it is simply a vegetated roof, a living roof. Um, and it's sort of a planted garden on the, the top of a, a building. It can cover part of the building or all of it. The picture here on the side is the part of the town hall roof in Sackville and the green roof that's up there. So there's two different kinds of green roofs, intensive and extensive, and it really has to do with how deep your soil is. Um, so if the soil is deeper than six inches and you've got an intensive roof, it can be quite deep. You can see if you go into bigger cities, there may be roofs where there's trees and shrubs and water features and all sorts of things going on up there, but it has to do with how much weight the building can hold. And so the town hall roof, um, after an engineering assessment, said that they could that that roof could handle about seven or eight inches of soil. So that meant that we're really planting, you know, grasses and flowers. We're not doing trees up there. You can also have extensive roofs, so that's shallower than six inches. So really, just a little bit of soil. Um, you're probably just growing grasses. Uh, it doesn't take as much maintenance, but maybe you can't do as much up there. Green roofs are also a form of natural infrastructure. So there was a question earlier about what can we do naturally. So this is just one example of a natural option. 
And natural infrastructure, if you haven't heard of that term yet, uh, it means that you're using ecological processes, natural landscapes for infrastructure outcomes. So there's this kind of natural infrastructure, but there's also what we call gray infrastructure. So that's our roads and culverts and pipes and things like that. But you can use nature to provide some of those services too, um, including ways to slow water down and slow rainwater down. Uh, so nature can help us solve problems like runoff, erosion, flooding by planting things. Um, but in terms of natural infrastructure, we can really only consider things that are active that were created for a particular purpose. So we don't usually think of just sort of natural forest as natural infrastructure, but these examples down here of rain gardens on the far side, the green roof, food forests, these are things that were planted for a purpose um, to provide sort of an infrastructure service. So getting back to the green roofs in Sackville, we um, helped create a couple of them last summer. We had funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada, so federal funding, um, and some other sources as well, but really the bulk came from the federal government. And the main uh, goals of that funding, they wanted to see natural infrastructure projects that would help reduce runoff, reduce flood risk. So a green roof was great. Um, and at EOS, as you could see, we've done a whole bunch of things in the past and I was trying to figure out what haven't we done, what could we use this funding opportunity for. And I knew there were a couple of roofs in Sackville that had been designed for green roofs and so there was opportunity there. Um, and uh, also an opportunity to um, promote the benefits of green roofs, to educate the public, and to continue to increase our community resilience and learn about what else we can do locally. So the two roofs, one uh, is at the town of Sackville, as you saw in the previous picture, and that's this is part of the green roof on the town hall. Uh, and the other is the student center at Mount A. So this is what used to be called Truman Hall or the student union building now, which looks out over the football field this way. So put a smaller green roof space up there as well. Um, and this is some signage that we have on the town hall. So in terms of um, the plan for this project or how we did it, we had to check again those engineering loads. So really important, even though these buildings were designed um, with the idea of a green roof, we wanted to still make sure that what we had planned would be okay because when you talk about how much soil is up there and then you add all the rain that's absorbed and the snow load and all that sort of stuff you have to make sure that it can handle it so engineering checks were um, most important to start off and luckily both buildings were still okay but to order the materials and the plants but we at EOS did not do the installation so at the town hall there we used a local landscaping company and at Mount A they used contractors um, that were qualified as well. But community members and EOS, we were able to do the fun part, which was planting things. Uh, so here's a picture of the town hall roof at night um, with some solar lighting that was installed as well. So we were able to extend an original section of green roof because the town hall here was built like 10, 12 years ago or so now. Um, and there was a small section of green roof put in, but the idea was to have this whole area green roof. And so that's what we were able to extend. Um, but because we also had a bit of cost savings as we did a lot of things with volunteers We were able to revive the original section and plant some new things um, Because that original section from 10 12 years ago the only plants still remaining were grasses and the town over the last However many years every summer they would hire a landscaper to go up and plant petunias or marigolds or whatnot and so uh, we were focusing more on perennials and native things that don't have to be planted every year so we were able to go back and revive that original section to match the new area and to plant maybe more appropriate things than just petunias. Um, and so, yeah, I mentioned that we've got solar lighting there. And now um, that our project is done and our funding is done, the roof continues to be maintained by Mount A staff, um, or by town staff here and Mount A on campus. So just a few pictures of the construction of the green roof and kind of what it looks like because when you're up there you just see the flowers and you don't get to see all the work that went in to actually create, um, create the roof and how it needs to fun function properly. So at the top corner you see that uh, it was Beach Hill Landscaping that installed all the layers so they had to lift everything up with a big crane to get it onto the roof carefully and spread it out because they were lifting up these huge tote bags of soil um, to cover this uh, huge area. And then you can see at the bottom all the different layers that get rolled down, taped down. And so you start with the substrate or the roof itself, the existing roof. Most important is a waterproof barrier, a waterproof membrane that gets rolled out, a root barrier. Um, there's a drainage layer, filter cloth, and then what the green roofers call growing medium. 
So it's the soil, but it's especially engineered soil to be more absorbent than just regular garden soil. It also has, um, it's got some rocks in it, I guess, to help with drainage and stuff too. So it's a different kind of soil. Um, and it's interesting too that the soil from the original section of the green roof from over a decade ago still seems to be, you know, very um, healthy. It's growing big, tall grasses. And we planted some vegetables in that section too this summer. And I kind of wondered, are they going to do anything? But we grew huge zucchinis and tomatoes and lots of lettuce and all sorts of stuff. So um, really good soil and appropriate for the green roof. So in terms of what we planted, uh, it was interesting to figure it out because we don't have a lot of examples of green roofs in New Brunswick or in our particular area in our climate. Uh, I just got a lot of advice and a lot of conflicting advice from different landscape architects, from different green roof companies, because at the town hall, they, their roofing system is a Suprema roof. On campus, it was a Tremco roof. So I was um, getting different input from both of those roofing companies and neither of the, the landscape architects on their staff from the Maritimes. So I was talking to people from um, Montreal, Quebec, Ontario, and stuff like that. So um, interesting to get all sorts of different viewpoints. I also talked with a professor at St. Mary's because they've had an experimental green roof on campus for a number of years. He also had different advice than what the landscape architects had and the roofers had. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Like even there was between Tremco and Suprema, somebody said, oh, you've got to plant yellow lilies. And somebody else said, why in the world would you plant yellow lilies? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not, not a botanist and not a landscape. Anyway, so, but we did our best and kind of planted a little bit of everything because gardening, whether you're on the ground or on the roof, it's kind of always an experiment. And uh, so here's just some of the things that, that we decided to plant. We also had to be careful too because our soil is only you know seven inches deep. And so we couldn't plant anything too tall because it would tip over, especially in like the wind last week. Um, you can see this area is part of the original section. And those grasses, these tall things, are the things that are remaining after a decade. But so I kind of went, you know, if they're, they're doing OK at about a meter or so, I won't plant anything that will grow any taller than that. Um, and then we also have quite a shady section. So this on Town Hall is looking at the fire station. And so that fire station wall creates quite a bit of shade on that side, which is also unusual for most green roofs. You think hot, dry sun all the time. Um, and so that's why uh, we've got some things that maybe wouldn't be found on other green roofs. Uh, and then we had to plant plants that are very flexible so that they can survive when it's dry, but they're okay when they're inundated after events like Fiona on the weekend. Although the town hall, um, town staff also installed a sprinkler system, so they can deal with things when it gets really dry. Anyway, so some of the things that we planted include native strawberries and wild blueberries. Uh, the wild blueberries came from my own backyard just to try, and they have actually produced blueberries, which is really nice because the professor at St. Mary's said the only berries that he's been able to get to produce on their roof have been the strawberries. So we're doing something uh, interestingly right, which is a little bit weird because this soil is not acidic the way that blueberries would really need it to be. So anyway, there have been a few blueberries. It's not, you know, massive, but we'll see how they do. Strawberries, on the other hand, amazing. So these are a native variety of strawberry. And oh, they were like big and juicy and beautiful. And um, you know, when we've had people up for tours and stuff like that in the spring, it was just perfect timing. So people got to enjoy some strawberries. We're hoping that as those um, plants do better and spread that you know we'll be able to actually harvest enough to donate to the food banks and that sort of thing. Um, and also, I haven't mentioned, but the the green roof on the town hall is open to the public. So anytime the town hall is open, the, you know, 8.30 to 4.30, their business hours, you are welcome up anytime. You can go up and have lunch. You can have a meeting. You can have a chat. You can bring up a book. There's picnic tables and benches, and they really consider it a public park. When we planted this and did this project last summer, of course, the pandemic was still going pretty strongly, and any of the events that we had planned to sort of launch had to be canceled um, and canceled over and over again. So anyway, we didn't get to do our big hurrah last summer, but we're trying to take any opportunity to remind people that you're allowed up there anytime you like um, to eat the strawberries. So go up in the spring or the blueberries later on in the summer. Uh, but we also planted things like switchgrass and sweetgrass and sedge, echinacea, black-eyed susans, asters, yarrow. And we did plant yellow lilies and they are doing very nicely. 
Uh, Pearly Everlasting, which was also dug up from the wild, it likes a dry, disturbed space. So that was something that Sean Blaney had suggested. So also local botanist with some different suggestions than others. Um, and then planted a lot of um, herbs because they don't mind it being warm and dry and sunny too. So that's just some of the things. Um, and then uh, there's one section, which I guess I'll get into a little bit more later too, but that um, shady section was one area that didn't do so well over the winter. And so we had to replant that this spring. And, um, and so we decided to plant things that aren't so native, but might do better in that condition. Cause I don't know necessarily how native or natural green roof is too. We're dealing with different conditions than we are on the ground. But so in that area that didn't do so well over the winter, we planted hostas, astelbees, things that really don't mind deep, deep shade, um, which that section is getting most of the day. Uh, so hopefully it will do better this winter. So some of the activities that we've done this summer to, uh, to help promote the, the green roof is, as I said, to call it a rooftop park um, and town staff are doing the same. We've had girl guides and other kids up there doing activities. We had the tantrum our seniors class up there for a class one day earlier in the summer. And we did plant vegetables, so zucchini, lettuce, herbs, and we got enough to make a really nice donation to the food bank towards the end of the summer. And they were so thrilled to have fresh vegetables grown on the roof right in Sackville. So looking to do more of that. Uh, as I said, you can have meetings, events, different things up there, um, and just go and you know have lunch on the benches. Um, town staff, the mayor also using the green roof to promote to other municipalities, other government officials when they get the chance to. Here's a picture of the green roof at Mount A. Uh, now this is back in the spring and I think they've added in some stepping stones and some diff different features and stuff now. Um, but this was a project that we were also able to help fund. Um, Mount A funded a large chunk of it as well. As I said, it's on the the roof of the student union building, so a space for students to enjoy. But it's also right beside Tweedy Hall, which is a space where they do meetings, functions, weddings, different things. So also nice to have this green space for those sorts of events. Um, it was designed by Mount A staff and some students, planted by students this spring. Uh, again, it's filled with native flowers, grasses, and herbs. A lot of similar things to what we planted at the town hall. Uh, and the teachers plan to use it as a green lab, as a teaching space, a learning space, an experimental space. It's up to the teachers, to um, the professors to maintain it. Uh, as I said, an entertaining space. You're looking out over the football field too. And then another uh, good reason why there was interest to do this on campus was for the mental health benefits for their students and having another you know, nice outdoor space to enjoy, especially during the pandemic when we don't wanna be inside on a beautiful day like today, but that's okay, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice to have outdoor spaces. Uh, so lots more benefits to the green roof as well. So even though the main reason why we did this was to reduce flood risk, reduce um, runoff off the building, lots of other good reasons too. So green roofs will help filter pollutants. They help add insulation to the building. So when you look at all those different layers that were put down, some of the layers are like felt, um, and then the soil itself adds insulation for sure. All of that helps protect the roof too. So at Mount A, facilities management love the fact that it would help protect and extend the, the life of their roof. But we're also increasing biodiversity. So as soon as we planted stuff, you're seeing bees and butterflies. So it sort of also doubles as a, a rooftop pollinator garden. Birds are up there too. Um, in especially in cities, they help to mitigate the heat island effect so much better than a black, you know, asphalt hard rooftop that it's absorbing the heat. Um, sequestering carbon because we're planting plants helps reduce our stress, connects us with nature. You really have to find a chance to go up there because it really is a special space to be up on a rooftop but surrounded by plants. Um, and also to be able to look out at that space too. So on campus, the green roof uh, is seen by the Mount A Students Union offices and, and different offices in the Student Union building, which is really nice for those folks too as space to grow food. So, hey, we definitely need to be taking all the opportunities and all the spaces so we can grow more food locally so that whether it's a winter storm or a, a hurricane or whatnot, and you know we're scrambling to find food, uh, that knowing that we can grow things locally and right there is so helpful. So all of this works together to create and enhance our community resilience. So we learned a lot through the green roof. Uh, we learned that there are not many roofs in New Brunswick, so hard to find examples of what would work and what wouldn't. Also, there aren't very many, um, or not all roofs are suitable, because we had to scramble a little bit when we thought we needed a different roof at one point. Not a lot of options out there. 
um, because we are looking for what they call an inverted roof. So, you know, you've got edges to it, so like you couldn't just pop a green roof really easily on the roof back there. Um, so you need to find particular spots. You need to find people that can partner with you because at EOS we can get project funding, but we don't get long-term funding. And so we still need to partner with people who can maintain the things that we have funding to start, but can't continue with. Um, so Mount A and the town have been great for that. There's no green roof manufacturers in the Maritimes as far as we could see, so everything had to be shipped from Ontario or Quebec. And during the pandemic last summer, that was a bit of a challenge and took longer than we thought that it would. Um, as I mentioned the challenges that we had in choosing plants, but we've done pretty well considering there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, local advice for us or local examples. Um, green roof installers, so it can be an, a landscape architect, um, but sometimes it needs to be the roofing company itself. Kind of depends on what your warranty might say. If you're wondering about cost for all of this, it was estimated at $20 to $25 a square foot. Um, and we did a little bit better than that because we had a lot of volunteers help because that's the community-based way to do it. Uh, the question about who will maintain the roof is uh, important to think about. We need more outdoor spaces, so these projects are great. And I have to still mention the flood risk uh, reduction because that was what kicked it all off. Um, so now I want to move on to our food forest projects. And this is one picture of a food forest at Port Elegant School. If you're not familiar with what a food forest is, it's essentially an edible perennial garden. So you're planting things that are kind of come up every year. Um, so trees, shrubs, plants, herbs, roots, ground cover, you have to think about all the different layers to a natural forest in order to try to mimic that forest ecosystem. And so all of this is kind of considering permaculture design techniques, so ways of planting things that will be there permanently um, and, natural, and sort of mimic natural environments. And so because of this, they don't need as much maintenance. They certainly need some maintenance because you still want to weed out the things you don't want and encourage the things that you do. But you're not planting every year like we would with our regular vegetable gardens. And they also require less water over time, which can be extremely helpful in those summers when we are seeing droughts. Um, and then because you're trying to mimic this forest environment, you're going to want to choose plants that have different functions. So things that are good for pollinators, the nitrogen fixing plants, things that have a natural mulching effect. You want to get all those different aspects of a forest in there. So we've done five of these food forests, community forests across our region. Tantramar High School, Dorchester, Port Elgin School, and with those were planted last summer. This past summer, um, we did one at Fort Folly First Nation and another space at the Sackville Community Garden. So the picture there on the side is at Fort Folly, and I'll tell you a little bit more about their forest in a bit. There's a lot of interest in food forests for a lot of different reasons, so we've been able to get funding from a lot of different groups, different levels of government. Um, and that's partly because food forests, again, have so many benefits and so many roles to play, from flood risk reduction to um, creating food sources, improving our environment. Lots of different things you can plant. It kind of depends on what location you're looking at, what would do best there, what you want to use your food forest for. This is a food forest that went in beside Dorchester School. So again, thinking about all those different layers, you're going to want to plant tall things like pear trees, shorter things like apple trees, berries, um, shorter berries and shrubs and stuff too, so the strawberries and blueberries, rhubarb and currants. So it's certainly a mixture of things that are native things that aren't, but that are perennial. And then all those sort of supportive, beneficial flowers that, uh, that give you all those extra important um, aspects of your, of your food forest. Uh, herbs as well, because they come up every year. Mushroom logs, walking grapes, or walking onions, sorry, sort of walking onions, and uh, riverbank grapes. So lots and lots of options, more than just what we listed there. If you're interested in a food forest for either your own backyard or your own community, a few tips on methods. Uh, so you're going to want to spend lots of time researching and designing really, um, you know, through a few months would be great and through different seasons to see and think about how your forest will, um, you know, act through the year. Uh, it's also really helpful to get the advice of a permaculture professional because, again, I'm not that either. Uh, and so we had help from Estelle Drisdell, and she's with Understory Farm and Design, not very far away from here, just outside Port Elgin. And so she really helped us to look at the different sites we were, we were going to be planting in, what would work, what wouldn't work, what would work together, um, and then also help us to prepare the site. So at the schools, we were planting on lawns, and so we had to get rid of the grass. So that's where the cardboard mulch comes in to suppress the grass, add soil, 
add some wood mulch. Um, select the plants, and, and this design is for the Dorchester School done by students, so we had lots of input, and the students got to be uh, involved in every step of the way. Volunteers and students were planting, and then again, with all these natural projects, it comes down to the long-term maintenance once our project funding is done. Um, but these projects are great for schools, great anywhere, but especially great for schools. It just teaches the kids so much about um, how to plant things, where their food comes from, how to use the food. Um, and in the schools, they're using what they're growing in their food for us for things like um, their breakfast programs, ingredients in the cafeterias, uh, in their cooking classes as well. At Port Elgin, they're making preserves to sell. They got a bit of a social enterprise thing going on. So many great things at Port Elgin School and all of our schools. And also hopes also to help our food banks when they get enough of a harvest going down the road. So I also wanted to mention the Fort Folly uh, Food Forest, which they're calling their community healing forest. So they um, acquired a property recently right beside their reserve boundary, which had been hit by an invasive beetle. So it looks essentially like a clear cut piece of property, about five acres. Uh, so they wanted to restore this property. They wanted to um, plant things of cultural and medicinal importance and food wise as well. So we designed this space again with Estelle's great advice and with community members. So, and we selected the plants and trees um, that they liked. So things like cedar, birch, ash, but also apple trees, different berries. Uh, and then we planted again. We had, I think, about uh, 16 or so volunteers come out that day and uh, plant hundreds of things. So it is a community space and a space for Fort Folly residents and others to connect with nature and connect with their traditional ways. Uh, so just like the green roof, loads of different kinds of benefits for these food forests. This is a picture of the food forest behind Tantramar High School. Um, so for sure, lots of great sustainable food. Uh, and these food forests, like other natural infrastructure projects, their value increases over time because the apple trees grow bigger, things grow in, fill in, you get more over time versus other um, options which could crumble over time. Uh, so again, helping for, with the runoff and flood risk reduction. We're also helping to protect and restore the soil so these food forests are better than just the grass that was there before. Because we're planting trees and plants again, we're looking at carbon sequestration. Um, we're increasing biodiversity, providing habitat, a lot of similar benefits to the green roof for sure. Um, less work and maintenance, things are growing every year, helping us to conserve water and uh, building, again, those self-sufficiency skills. So really important for our students to be learning that uh, and helping them to reconnect and connect with nature too. So we also learned lots through the Food Forest Projects a great positive feel good kind of project, very action oriented, um, really easy to get people excited about climate action when we're also talking about food and doing this sort of thing together um, because for sure the climate message is always um, hard to deal with but when you turn it around into an action project like this, it's very positive. Uh, these projects also hit at a really good time because the pandemic also was spurring new people's interest in gardening. Uh, so we had a lot of people interested in coming out to learn and, and to help at the same time. Uh, you want to make sure you're choosing plants that are suited to our maritime climate. We bought everything locally, so we weren't importing things from Ontario and, um, you know, supporting our local businesses as well, but planting things would be suited to our local climate. It is a big job, so we had a lot of volunteers involved in every project, a lot of students. Um, and then those partnerships are key too. So. As I said, it's been great to partner with Fort Folly, with the town of Southville, with all of our schools. And I have an opportunity. So I have two more of these food forests, community forests to plant next spring and summer. So I'm looking for two more sites. I may have one in Memram Cook possibly, but for sure I'm looking for one more. So if you're in the Memram Cook, Tantramar, Strait Shores region and you know of a good community space that uh, a food forest might be suitable for, I would love to hear from you. It does need to be a publicly accessed location, um, and I need some partners, of course, to do all the things I just talked about. Um, and then even if you don't have a space, but you might like to volunteer with our future projects, I'd love to hear from you as well. So then onto our sea level rise awareness project. We wanted to raise awareness about sea level rise and what it might look like in our area in the future. Uh, we partnered with a group called the, the CCCC, so that stands for Chignecto Climate Change Collaborative, and that's a network of professionals in our area here working on climate adaptation issues. 
So planners, emergency measures folks, researchers, government, um, everybody coming together. So it, we created these signs. There are three of them. There used to be four. There used to be one at Bay Vert Community Park, but somebody took it. So there's only three left. Um, still helpful, though. Yeah, so kind of interesting. If anybody sees a random sea level rise sign around, let me know because somebody took it out shortly after we installed it. Um, which also is an interesting story in and of itself because all of a sudden when you say right here that, you know, here's the previous storm, you add a meter of sea level rise, this is where the flood level could be in the future, and that's near people's houses. People don't want other people to know that, but um, I mean, we're all becoming more and more aware, and so hopefully, um, you know, we won't see people stealing signs like that so much in the future. But the signs we have remaining are right here at Cape Charmaine. So along the, uh, what do you call it, Daniel? The Salt Marsh Trail? Yeah. Is that the name yeah. of it? Uh, that way. Yeah. yeah. So there's one sign there. There's one at the Village Wharf. And there's one on our other coast at uh, Johnson's Mills Shorebird Interpretive Center. So on the Fundy side. So each sign... Um, has a, a level for a previous storm. So out here, Cape Germain and Port Elgin, it shows a storm level from 2010 when there was a storm surge that came into the village back then. And then if you add that meter of storm surge, uh, or a meter of sea level rise, sorry, you can see the impact that could be there in the future. And so these visual markers are really key because you can go up to the sign and then look around and really um, have a good visual cue of what could be impacted um, in the future. So we wanted to promote these signs in different ways. So a really good way to do that is with geocaching. And so I don't know if any of you are geocachers, but if you are, you'll see our three signs. Uh, they each have an earth cache associated with them. So that's a bit of an earth lesson. So you get some background information on the geocaching website. And then you need to go and locate the signs and answer some questions once you're there actually looking around at what's going on in that particular location. So these have been really popular, and we continue to get people visiting. I, my, the last note was that somebody was here at Cape Germain from Ontario and said that she had never been to this sort of an earth cache, hadn't had a lesson about sea level rise and what could be done. So we get a lot of favorite points. We get a lot of thank yous. Also, before Fiona hit, there was a big group of people that were up here from South Carolina. And so it's really neat to have this sort of a little bit of online interaction with people from all over the world coming to visit our beautiful locations like Cape Germain. We get a little bit of a lesson about what we're looking at here. So the last community-based program that I want to share with you is our very new um, Home Flood Risk Assessment Program. So it's to uh, help homeowners reduce their basement flood risk. In particular, we're looking at basement flooding. And it's in partnership with the Intac Center. So this is a program that they've developed that um, other cities and communities have offered. It hasn't been done in New Brunswick, certainly not in our area. So we wanted to try our hand at that because, again, we're just looking for what else can we do locally on our own to help each other out. Um, we have funding from the provincial government, New Brunswick's Environmental Trust Fund, to offer this program and also a bit of fundraising as well through EOS efforts. Um, I'm still going through the training for this program. It just got updated and kind of re-released and stuff, so I'm still going through the training, but I understand that it, it will involve a 50-point visual assessment. So once I finished with all the training, then I would go to your house and actually have a look with you inside and outside at all sorts of different um, possibilities. Like here they're looking at window wells, and so this is an option. I've never seen this before, but a cover for your window well to help the rain uh, stay out. You get customized advice. Everything is confidential, private. Nothing is going to insurance companies or the province or anything. It's just for your own advice to do what you would like with. Um, and so some of the examples of advice that might come out of your home risk assessment are things like, well, maybe you need proper landscape grading. So maybe you actually have an a lot of these things are things that Nick and I have dealt with at our house. Um, so it would have been great to have this whole 50-point system to go through before we ended up with issues. But if you have areas that you know are slanted towards your building, then the rain's going to have an easier way to find its way into your basement. So there could be a landscape grading um, suggestion, maybe good spots for those rain gardens or spots to absorb rain somewhere else. Um, maybe you don't have downspouts, or maybe the ones you have aren't long enough or aren't bringing the water far enough away from your basement. Um, rain barrels also really helpful. 
patching cracks in the foundation. So we'd go around and look at the foundation. And it doesn't take much of a crack because we had that as well in our house where it was just the tiniest bit and water will find its way in. Window well covers could be an option. Installing sump pumps, backwater valves, other devices, raising valuables in your basement, um, securing oil tanks. Anyway, there's a huge long list of possible things that you could be doing to reduce your flood risk in your basement. Um, for participants, you'll also get some information on rebates that do exist, and unfortunately, there aren't very many. There is the Federal Greener Homes Grant, and I think a lot of us know about that for energy efficiency upgrades, but there is a small section for what they call resiliency upgrades. Um, but then also for participants in our program, we'll offer a rebate, and we've been doing a bit of fundraising because we can't get money for rebates from government um, so far that we've been aware of, so trying, again, to do that locally. Um, and perhaps it'll be something like $100 per homeowner towards, you know, your purchase of a sump pump or backwater valve or plants for a rain, um, rain garden or whatever you might need or want to do. Um, and so we'll continue to try to raise some funds for those efforts too, especially for people who are most vulnerable and can't afford those needed upgrades. So as I said, this is for homes, cottages, anywhere where, you know, you've got a basement um, across our region here. We might extend it beyond two. Uh, and we're looking to do this this fall and early winter before the snow flies. So I'm racing to finish the training so that I can offer these assessments. And I do already have a bunch of people that have signed up, but there are still spots left. So I encourage you to get in touch if you're interested. Completely free and nice to have that funding from the provincial government to allow us to do this and offer them for free. Um, and I'll give you my contact information on the last slide again there too. So just to wrap it up, some things for you to, to think about and take away with you. Uh, and to remember that climate, uh, that community-based climate change adaptation builds great local skills, builds important local capacity. Um, we can use nature to solve those challenges like stormwater runoff, flooding, food security, all at the same time. And that's what's nice about these um, natural projects is they have so many benefits. We're taking off so many things at the same time. Um, community involvement creates ownership, creates empowerment, um, also hope and, uh, you know, if, if you've got your hands literally in the dirt um, and helping to make a difference in your community, that um, helps raise our spirits at the same time. You don't have to be an expert. I think I said that a few times through the presentation. Not an expert, not a counselor, not a landscape architect, um, not, not very many things, but able to coordinate, able to learn, able to ask questions and partner with the people who do, do know so that we can make these projects happen and try things out. Um, so I'd encourage you to go home and, or back to your communities and plant a tree or plant a rain garden, plant a food forest. Contact me if you've got a good spot uh, for a food forest because I'm looking for that. And if you've got a basement that has flooded in the past or you're in a flood risk area, where I live, we're on the top of a hill, so we never really thought that we would get flooding. But at one point, our drain tile, the pipe clogged and water backed up that time. So you just never know. Good to have like that chance to go around and really look at everything. Um, so I encourage you to sign up for a flood risk assessment if you're interested. And then get involved, learn more, volunteer, spread the word. As we said, I think at the end of Jeff's presentation about how you vote and um, all that sort of stuff for bigger changes is super important too. So thank you very much. All right, excellent. So thank you so much, Amanda. And I will pass around the microphone if there are some questions in the room. But before I do, I have a few uh, online here, which I'll get mm -hmm. to first. And so one of them from Samira uh, was asking about how they can become involved in projects in the Sackville area. But I think that you already spoke to that in terms of volunteer opportunities. Yeah, definitely. So any, you can just send me an email or call the office and say, I'd like to volunteer and I'll add you to the list. And then we are sending out volunteer opportunities all the time. And you can pick and choose. You can say, yep, I want to work on a food forest, but I don't want to do climate change week. I don't know, whatever the case might be. Yeah, I'm always looking for volunteers. It's super easy for folks, I think. Okay, excellent. And then one other question from Bonnie Lee, uh, and this is actually a question I had as well. Can you provide where you sourced your native plants? Um, I wish to add more to my own gardens and I'm finding it difficult sourcing ethically gathered native plants. Mm, yeah, well, and it's been a pro and a con with the pandemic because all of a sudden there were so many more gardeners. So what I thought would be really easy to get was really hard and then we had to change um, some of you know our plan because we just couldn't get certain things. 
So we've gotten as native as we could. Sometimes it's a cultivated version and that sort of thing, but we've ordered a lot of stuff through Cornhill. Um, so they're really the number one place to go to, but we also got stuff from um, Anderson's Greenhouse, but now they won't be with us anymore. So I'm really sad about that. But so Cornhill has been great because they deliver right to our region as well. Um, but then, there, and then there's also Otter Creek here in Port Elgin. So I guess there wasn't so much, well, she's got some native like nut trees and stuff like that. She has a lot of the hostas, which were helpful for our green roof. Um, and then I've just learned about Sunrise Nursery in Cormier Village, and I was able to get native trees for our food forest projects, and he delivered to Sarful too, which was really nice. I need to go, I don't know if any of you have been to Sunrise Nursery, I need to go there, because that looks like an interesting space that I was just told about. So there's different options for, for sure, for sure. Perfect, and if there's any more questions for those um, watching virtually, then please ask them in the chat room and I will get to those. Uh, is there anybody in the room here that would like to make a comment or a question? I'll hand over the microphone. Yeah. Uh, I'll just, I'll give you the microphone. Okay. It's not that exciting a question, but uh, <laughs> That's okay. we have a, I have a, a base, uh, a, a cottage without a basement, and uh, I get a lot of water particularly after Fiona. Yeah. Uh, is it wise to put, so what I've been putting down is shutters, old shutters, to give it a bit of a floor. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that is a good idea or not, because it's still wet underneath the shutters. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's much more comfortable for the person that's down there, you know, to crawl around. I just wonder if, it would be bet, you know, should I be waiting until the earth is dry and that kind of thing? Well, I'm really excited to finish this training, which I've just started in the last few days. So I don't know if I have a great answer for you yet, other than I guess you always want to make sure your basement can dry out because you don't want to be worried about mold issues and stuff. So yeah. it, you'd have to go down and have a look, but I think you want to make sure you can dry things out. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I figured that's what you were going to say. Anyone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> else in the room who has any questions or comments for Amanda? If not, then I have a couple. I'll, I'll just have one going on the climate change adaptation plan. Yeah. Uh, just like to have a little bit more of your involvement in developing the uh, plans with the communities that you've worked with, and mm -hmm. how many of those plans have you developed so far? Yes, so we were able to get funding from the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund for each of those plans. So Port Elgin has a plan, Dorchester, Sackville, they each have municipal adaptation plans um, from quite a few years ago now. They sort of run their course and now that we're looking at amalgamation it will be time to do those again with the new expanded areas. But yeah, it was EOS who applied for the funding. Um, I mean, we had talked to our municipal, the municipal staff in each of those communities to say, you know, we think this would be a good idea. Are you interested? They said, yep, yeah, but we don't have the capacity or the time or whatnot. So if you can find the funding, you know, and so that's what we were able to do. So we coordinated the whole process, but we didn't tell our communities, this is what you need to do but had a conversation and got lots of input from community members, especially in Port Elgin and Dorchester. Those were more community-based plans. Um, and so workshops and information booths and looking at a lot of flood risk maps and looking at examples of what's been done in other communities that could work in those places. Um, had a little adaptation um, planning committee in each community, so that would involve counselors, staff, EMO coordinators, uh, depending on the community anyway, different folks who were involved, community representatives as well, who all got together, looked at the flood risk maps, looked at what would be impacted, um, there is a whole process to follow through uh, and then you kind of have a discussion about what are your big priorities uh, and it's a little bit different in each community so it's flooding, it's sea level rise, it's winter storms, ice storms, um, anyway and, and I think our list would be longer now than they were you know all those years ago um, and then you look to other other regions, other countries, for examples of, of what could help you deal with those issues. And um, anyway, write down your actions and write down your timeline and who should do what. It's an action plan like it is for any other issue, but you're often starting with, in our area, those very important flood risk maps. And now we have lots of good flood risk mapping in New Brunswick to help us all too. So, 
And then, even though we've got those great plans, then there are some things that are very hard to fund. Like in Port Elgin, their very low-lying sewage lagoon, which is also in an area or right beside the Gaspar River where it's eroding, um, that's a big infrastructure project, and it's it's still hard to find find funding for those big projects. I mean, anyway, everything that you know Jeff mentioned to the all of the parks and. Harley Beach and all these things that are very clear. All of this will cost a lot of money, but a very you need the plan as a starting point. But man, to find the money for those big infrastructure projects, that is a whole other challenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just a quick question: Have you have you heard of anywhere anyone building um, a green roof on a, a single-family wood frame building? Not locally, but in other parts of the world, they certainly do. You see those lovely, like, thatched roof, grassy roof, you know, on an angle, too, because, I mean, the type of roof that we were doing, it's got to be more those flat, inverted, bigger scale kind of things. But, yeah, you can, but I can't think of any examples locally. I'd love to see that. Um, other than there is the, um, in Nova Scotia on the eastern shore, it's called the, uh, oh, what is it called, the Deanery Project? Have you heard? Yeah, and so they partner sometimes with the landscape or with the architecture department at Dal, and students will do interesting, innovative things. And their outhouse there has a little grassy green roof on it. So they do some interesting things, alternative um, architecture, alternative building techniques, and stuff. So you could always talk to the Deanery Project for ideas like that. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, that was actually one of my questions too, you know, whether there's any homes that have incorporated green roofs or it's larger, you know, commercial and institutional, you know, buildings, because I imagine it's quite a expensive and, you know, kind of in-depth affair to, to do. Uh, just one other question I had, do you know generally what the life of a green roof is? Is it usually something that will last for quite a long time? Um, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if there's really any end point to it. Like looking at the existing green roof on the town hall that's over a decade old and still growing things perfectly fine and operating but that yeah um so good question i will see if i can find out if they're really at some point you know way down the road you need to do something but it's good for many 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 years well, perfect i just i know a lot of you know homes and buildings lost many shingles for example yeah. during during the hurricane so i wonder how a green roof you know for instance would hold yeah, up to that sure. for sure our green roofs did well. They didn't blow away. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, really great to hear about some of the work you know, that's being done at EOS in ways that communities can build resilience and adapt to those impacts of climate change. Thanks. And so next up, our final presentation uh, will be monitoring monarchs and milkweed in New Brunswick by Alicia McGratton with Nature NB. And as some of you may know, we planted several pollinator gardens at Cape Tremaine last year. You can actually see them out the window there. They don't look as great as they do in the midsummer, but getting to that time of year. Um, and some of the plants that we put in there were milkweed, and we actually were fortunate to have monarch butterflies here this summer. And so just outside the door there to the right, we do have a little display talking about monarchs, and there's a slideshow of pictures, uh, most of which were taken here at Cape Tremaine. And so I am excited to hear more about that in Alicia's presentation. So uh, please bear with us. We'll take another two to three minute break to transition over to the next uh, presentation. Did you just fold this or did you clip it?